Great. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, I appreciate all of you taking some time. And I hope you guys are all having a good start of the week uh, and had a good day. So again, as you've seen, this lecture is talking about mastering crowd lengthening. Um, we have a lot of stuff to go over. Uh, this lecture I've given at other conferences in the past has been about a three and a half to four hour lecture. So we've had to really focus on some of the more pertinent parts and sections. Uh, so I have quite a bit of material to get through for everybody. So we'll do that. And again, I'll leave plenty of time at the end so I can you know, provide as much opportunity as possible to answer all your questions. Uh, as mentioned, I am a practicing periodontist here in the city of Boston. Uh, I've been uh, teaching for about a decade uh, in the period program at Harvard. Uh, I've been involved on the lecture circuit uh, over many years, but I'm very happy to be a part of Catapult now. Um, and again, there's quite a bit to go through, so I want to jump right in and let's get this lecture started. So we look at our course objectives for tonight. Like I said, there's quite a bit of material to cover. Uh, in regards to crown lengthening, we're going to review the surgical and periodontal anatomy indications, contraindications of the procedure itself, uh, really focus on the biologic width, and hopefully you'll all, all learn things uh, that you probably weren't aware of prior when it comes to biologic width. We'll go over all sorts of things, even from a surgical standpoint, in terms of incision design, flap design, uh, the osseous resective surgery uh, techniques, suturing techniques, and we'll spend some time on uh, post-operative and, and maintenance areas. So we have quite a bit to go through. So just to kind of get the ball rolling here, of course, as we all are aware, uh, the main re reasons that we lose teeth uh, are either periodontal disease or decay. Of course, the third outlier is, is trauma. But, you know, as it relates to our lecture, when we're looking at crown lengthening, we're really focused on two different parts of this, uh, which is decay and trauma. And these stats continue to grow over time. Uh, it was prior that there's over 20 million teeth uh, that are extracted each year. Those numbers are actually even higher now. And you've got about half of the population uh, that has at least an edentulous site you know, later on in life. So this situation of being presented to us uh, in terms of crown lengthening versus extraction and other options is, is very common. Of course, you know, if we wanna try and as they say, save somebody's teeth, uh, you know, how could we fight back? And of course that process, whether it's in the aesthetic zone or elsewhere is known as crown lengthening. So just to go through the formalities here in terms of the definition, what we look at when we talk about crown lengthening is a surgical procedure performed to expose a greater amount of tooth structure for the purpose of subsequently restoring it. So again, our primary uh, etiology with this is insufficient tooth structure. Again, whether that might be because of decay, whether it's because of trauma uh, or other reasons, that's really what we're uh, you know, going for with this type of a procedure. So, you know, as we start to look at these cases, we'll, we'll look at this one right off the bat as just a photo and hopefully what you notice now and the nuances that go into actually treating a case like this, uh, by the time we get to the end of this lecture, your perspective, ideas, and your mindset in terms of how you would go about actually executing this procedure will be uh, hopefully further enhanced from what we're going over tonight. So uh, again, you know, looking at this, is there a problem? Of course, our eyes should be focused on the fact that we don't have a lot of tooth structure. Uh, and in order to try and make some, you know, good prosthetic outcome that will last a long time, we're looking towards restoring these. And of course, as we get later into the presentation, into some of the surgical areas, you can see that just by flapping these areas, we have a very minimal amount of tooth structure, which will again, we'll go into in far more detail. And so kind of showing a before and after, uh, we'll be learning by the end of this program how to you know, go about treating cases just like this. So, you know, when we look at crown lengthening as a whole, I like to kind of break it up into three different types. There's the functional or more of kind of the, you know, known as traditional crown lengthening, which is the primary, again, focus of our lecture tonight to go over in detail. Uh, and then there's other two other types of breakdowns that we uh, go into. One is the aesthetic uh, cases that everybody is probably very well familiar with. And there's a third category I always like to go into in terms of pathologic iatrogenic, in terms of uh, cases that we actually treat, but that end up reverting and having problems down the line uh, for things that we, you know, cause by accident. So again, for the focus of tonight's lecture, we're putting all our energies into this functional section. Uh, for you to be aware, we are planning a part two, you know, continuation of this discussion 
to go in a lot more detail A to Z with the aesthetic and then the third part as well. Uh, so stay tuned for more information from Catapult on that soon. But again, we're going to be focusing on this first part, which is the functional. And like I said, plenty of stuff to go over. But, you know, I always like in any lecture to give an alternative perspective. It's not all about telling everybody how crown lengthening is the greatest thing on earth. And once you learn how to do this, all your problems are going to be solved. Of course, nothing in life and especially nothing in dentistry is like that. So one question that I really want to stress upon everybody to ask themselves on any case that they're presented, those that will review here tonight and those that you will you know, face uh, yourself as a clinician in your practice is the simple question of, is it worth it? And what exactly is it that we mean by that? Well, at the end of the day, in order to determine and decide to do a crown lengthening procedure, well, you're putting the patient through you know, what's called and considered a periodontal surgery. Of course, you're gonna be going through the process of uh, making a new crown. And you know, depending on where that decay or where that trauma occurred and how deep it may have happened, there may be some combination of a root canal. And depending on your restorative principles, if you like doing the post and core process, that might be a part of it. So it's not just a one-step thing. There's a lot of things that we are now committing our patient to by deciding to do this procedure. Of course, on top of that, like we have to deal with every day, there's the financial commitment, which is always a huge discussion. And of course, you know, something that I have to deal with on a daily basis, there's that added stress of surgery. Even though I don't like using that word myself in clinic, uh, you know, with patients during consults, at the end of the day, it's the word that's always tossed around. And for a patient to mentally think, hey, I'm going to be doing a gum surgery, there's a lot of added apprehension, a lot of added stress and tension, which of course then is transla uh, translated upon us when we're actually doing the procedure. So, uh, but then, you know, the bigger questions that we'll get into in detail are, are the actual, you know, long-term prognosis of the tooth. Okay, we can do this procedure, but what does that mean in the end of the day in the long run? So, I, I like uh, as a comparison to compare crown lengthening to endo. You can ask an endodontist and for any tooth, you know, can you do a root canal on this? And almost always their answer is going to be, well, sure, we can do a root canal on it. Of course we can. But it's not so much a question of can you do it, but it's a question of is it the right thing to do? You know, what's going to be the long term? Is it worth doing? And that's something I really want to stress for all of us today as we go through crown lengthening. And of course, Part of the reason for that is unlike, you know, decades past, there are a lot of modern predictable alternatives, of course, dental implants being one of them, uh, and bridges as being, you know, a possible alternative option. So we'll discuss all of this, but keep this part in mind, and we're going to keep asking ourselves, is it worth it? And as we ask that question, we're going to look at some of these cases as we go through, and I'm just throwing up a couple of different examples. Again, unfortunately, we're not in person for me to have a pointer and be able to point these out one at a time. But as you can appreciate from each of these different cases for different reasons, these are all cases that have been referred at one point or another with considerations of doing crown lengthening, whether it's trauma and the patient having broken a portion of the tooth, uh, decay under a crown, uh, decay as a result of doing you know, uh, orthodontic therapy, as you see there on the bottom right. Now we've gotten near the pulp canal. Uh, we're, again, we're undergoing orthotherapy. Is this something that we wanna do or not? So there's a lot of these considerations. And again, this is why we keep returning and we will keep returning back to this question of, is it worth doing or not? So just to give an overview as uh, now that we've gotten through that introductory section, here's the presentation outline. Uh, the first thing we're gonna go over the etiology and indications for the procedure. Uh, we're gonna spend some time, as I mentioned, on biologic width considerations. Uh, I'll spend some time reviewing instrumentation technique the importance of magnification and illumination, uh, some suturing, post-op expectations and considerations, which I think is probably the most overlooked section and you'll appreciate why as soon as we get through that. Uh, obviously, we'll spend some time uh, showing a couple cases, depending on you know, time permitting how many I can get through. We'll discuss, again, potential alternatives. And then we'll wrap things up talking about some of the post-op uh, considerations, maintenance, what we have to think about in terms of medications, uh, look at some complications that this procedure uh, will entail and kind of wrap everything up with some conclusion. So a uh, bunch to get through. So with that being said, we'll jump into our part one and go through some of the basics. And here's an example of a before and after of something we would love to see. And, and all of you will be doing once you get through this lecture, if you already are doing so uh, at this point. So I'm going to start out with a quote. And this was a quote from an old uh, perio faculty of mine at uh, Penn. 
Uh, he was one of the prominent uh, lecturers and also a board uh, certifier for many decades. So, uh, you know, he was somebody that we looked up to. And early on during our perio training, he gave us this quote where he said, the most difficult surgical procedure in periodontics is crown lengthening and osseous resection. And I, I found that a little bit odd. And I was thinking to myself, well, I'm coming into a perio residency thinking about, you know, tissue grafting, sinus lifts, and GBRs and all these big procedures. And yet here's this, you know, well-known, well-respected board faculty telling you, no, actually the toughest thing you're going to do is crown lengthening. And, you know, why is that? And again, we'll go back to this at the end of our lecture. And sure enough, to kind of back up one, one thing that you mentioned is a prior article in 2008, which basically said that among the dental community, about 40% of the dentists that they surveyed were doing some type of periodontal procedure, some type of periodontal surgical procedure on their own. Of course, the most common among those are some type of osseous and crown lengthening type of procedure. As imagined, when it came to mucogingival procedures, bone grafting, GTR, some of those, again, the bigger ones we would entail, uh, the dental community tended to shy away from it. But when it came to doing crown lengthening, it seemed like there was a lot of enthusiasm in terms of being able to tackle this and more than anything, confidence in being able to do this. So the question I have, and that we'll go through as we go through the lecture is, well, where's the disconnect? If a periodontist who's been doing it for decades is saying that's the toughest thing, and yet the dental community's perception is, we can't do some of these other procedures. Oh, but when it comes to crown lengthening, we can. There's obviously quite a bit of a disconnect in terms of where that mentality is coming from. So we'll hopefully answer some of those reasons why and try and put those dots together through this lecture. So when we look at indications for when we would wanna do such a procedure, like we said, the primary source and reason we're gonna talk about is insufficient tooth structure. But why is there insufficient tooth structure? Well, there's quite a bit of reasons that that could be the case. One of them would be decay at or below the gingival margin. Like we mentioned, trauma in the form of a tooth structure, uh, tooth fracture, again, at or below the gingival margin. You, you could have a situation of excessive occlusal or incisive wear, either from grinding, clenching, or just you know, general wear over the, over the years and decades. You could have cases that have to deal with root perforation or root resorption that then present themselves with that option. Inefficient occlusal space for restorative work where you now, again, are short on tooth structure and require more. Or in some cases, as part of our you know, third iatrogenic section, sometimes we excessively prepare our crowns and put ourselves in a situation where we need to do that. So there are quite a bit of indications as to why this procedure might be necessary. So there are quite a bit of key questions that we're going to need to ask ourselves, both from a pre-op standpoint, during the procedure, and the post-op. And we're going to start kind of hitting on some of these right now. So prior to even starting a crown lengthening procedure, if I am being referred a case, wherever it might be, these are some of the ones I am asking myself immediately. First off, how much sound tooth structure do I have and how much is really necessary? Now, of course, part of that will be in coordination uh, with the restorative doctor, or if you're doing it yourself in terms of what you're hoping for, for a final margin, which we'll talk about, but we have to have an understanding of what we even have as a baseline. How much sound tooth structure do we have to begin? The next question is, where is that final preparation margin going to end? Where is it presently? Where is it that we want it to end? What is kind of our ideal? What is our plan? And that is so important. I can't tell you how many times that I've had cases referred my way where this uh, you know, final preparation margin information is not communicated. So if I don't know where you're hoping to end you know, your preparation margin, that obviously makes doing the procedure that much more complicated. So that's another very important thing before you start to try and know if possible. The next question is, what is the condition of the adjacent teeth? Again, so many times we're focused solely on the tooth that we want to treat that we tend to overlook the adjacent teeth. And anytime you're talking about a crown lengthening procedure, as you'll find out, whatever you're doing on that tooth that needs this procedure is also going to affect the neighboring teeth. So the best analogy I always use with patients every day is basically, look, you know, if your neighbor's house catches on fire, your house is right next to it. So you're at risk as well. And though it may not get the same brunt of the fire as you know the, the whole house, it doesn't mean that your house is gonna be unaffected. So we have to think about those adjacent teeth just as much, radiographs playing a key role. Of course, we have to look at the biologic width. 
uh, which we'll go into in detail. We have to consider the crown to root ratio, uh, not only prior, but again, most importantly, once the procedure is completed, what are we looking at for that ratio later? Uh, we have to take the percation into consideration, which we'll get into in detail why that's so critical. And I hope, again, uh, impress upon you why this is another uh, essential factor that complicates our lives during this procedure. And again, as we keep harping on over and over again, is the alternative. Would the alternative be better for the long term? So these are all questions that I'm asking for these cases before I've even done anything. Now, once the procedure starts and we're actually in surgery, which we'll go into again in more detail, some of the uh, considerations that I'm looking at are whether or not there are osseous legacy defects, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. The frication, which we talked about, which we're gonna learn this term called the CDF or the critical distance to the frication. And you'll all appreciate later on why four millimeters is our magic number that we all wanna take as a take home message. Uh, we have to consider what the aesthetic outcome is going to be, especially if this is in the aesthetic zone. But even if it isn't, what is this going to do to our aesthetic outcome? And then do things clinically match what we saw radiographically? And what I mean by that is an example, as you see right below, where this was an actual case sent my way for crown lengthening. Uh, that again, as you saw, once the flap was raised for the procedure, we did some probing pre-op and noticed there was some very deep pocketing which if you were to simply go by the radiographs in two dimensions, for whatever reason, the way that X-ray was, uh, the radiograph was angled, it didn't catch this massive pocket that was present. And long story short, this was a tooth that was not a good, uh, you know, tooth for crown lengthening. So, you know, we have to do some of this periodontal probing and preparation prior because, you know, what a radiograph shows doesn't always tell the full story. So another question that we have to ask ourselves is what is the effect of the restorative margin on the development and health of the suprapresto attachment apparatus? Now, to answer this very elongated, fancy worded question, we're basically wanting to look at the biologic width. So I do wanna spend some time on this because as you'll see, the number that we all know kind of comes from nowhere. So what is it in terms of a definition? As we all know, the biologic width is defined as the natural distance of a tooth from the gingival sulcus to the alveolar crest. So the basic number that all of us have ever you know, learned and been told to memorize is three millimeters. So we've got three different parts to this. We've got our connective tissue attachment, we've got our epithelial attachment, and we have our sulcus measurement. And basically what we've come to learn over time is that you take these three numbers, Roughly each of them are about a millimeter each. Biologic width therefore equals three millimeters. So let's dive into this a little bit deeper to appreciate where this number came from. And to do that, we gotta go way back to 1966. Yes, believe it or not, the biologic width number of three millimeters was born out of this article in 1966. Now, what's so interesting about this article though, is that basically what they did is that they looked at mean values for all of these terms that we talked about, the connective tissue, the epithelial attachment, and the sulcus. So they took these cadaver models together, they put all of the measurements in one, and when they took the mean values, and again, if you think of mean, it's basically an average of everything. And by doing those mean values, these three numbers are what they came up with. So what they figured as a result of this is when they did the math, they put two and two together and they said, okay, if we look at these three numbers, 1.07, 0 0.97 and 0.69, and we add them up, we're coming up with a gingival complex dimension of 2.73 millimeters. And of course, nobody's gonna go by 2.73 millimeters. So what do they do? They said, well, that's about three millimeters. So this magic number that we all go by, a biologic width of three millimeters was born straight from this exact study. Now, what are some of the shortcomings though of the study which impact the results? Well, first of all, these numbers were tabulated on cadavers on decalcified section. And like I said, these are mean values, they're averages. And what do I mean by that? Well, look at that red box that I have highlighted there and appreciate how significant these differences are. Look at the ranges for the sulcus. The ranges for the sulcus measurements range from zero to 2.62 millimeters. The attached epithelium range from 0.28 to 3.72, and the connective tissue attachment range from 0.04 all the way to 3.36. 
So again, from these numbers, they got the mean numbers of 0 0.69, 0 0.97, and 1.07. However, if you look at the two extremes, in some cases, according to this study and their measurements, the biologic width, if you added them up, was only around 0 0.32. And in other cases, if you look at the high extreme, the biologic width was over nine millimeters. So if you've got such a significant range and such a uh, significant variation, I hope that can help everybody appreciate why simply saying that that number is three is kind of not, not really accurate, is it? So this was kind of revisited years later. Of course, this is 1966 for the first one. So years later in 1994, Vasek uh, came back and basically revisited the discussion. Uh, they still did these numbers. They still did their study on cadavers except that they were done on non-decalcified instead of decalcified sections. And basically what they noted was that there was a variability of this number between the anterior and the posterior teeth. So what they were getting in the front was actually very different than what they were getting in the back. And again, this is something that will play a significant role in the part two lecture when we talk about aesthetic crown lengthening. And again, we'll save that for part two. But the bottom line here is to, again, appreciate the fact that the numbers that they got uh, varied quite significantly, whether you were in the anterior or you were in the posterior. And again, as you can see on the right-hand side, those ranges also differ uh, quite significantly as well. So the take-home message for everybody tonight is we all generically say biologic width equals three millimeters. Where the heck did that come from? Well, it came from these studies, but these studies themselves are only you know, taking those numbers as a mean value. And if you look at them, you know, case by case and an overall range, the, the values are quite significantly different. And we have to therefore appreciate that three millimeters generically is not necessarily what we want to go by. So that's kind of the biologic width part I wanted to take into account. And of course, the second part is the ferrule, which again, taking a straight definition from the prosthetic uh, glossary, we all know uh, of the ferrule looking at uh, talking about being the metal band or ring used to fit around. And basically what the prosthodontic literature has uh, concluded for us is that basically we really want to have a minimal height of about a millimeter and a half to two millimeters of intact tooth structure above the crown margin. That's kind of our ideal in terms of a ferrule. So if we try and kind of just do some simple math and take some numbers together in an ideal world, again, if we look at the ferrule, we're around a millimeter and a half to two millimeters that we'd like. If we look at our biologic width, of course, if we went go by the generic number of three, the bottom line is in order to have a successful case and a, and a, and a healthy crown length of tooth, we really want to have a good four and a half to five millimeters of healthy tooth structure when we complete this procedure. <clears throat> so again, going back to our considerations when we start the case, that's a pretty healthy amount of tooth structure that we need to have. And so we need to look at our clinical and radiographic uh, you know, features and, and, and uh, considerations and see whether or not that is something that we are able to successfully provide. So like we said, the, the decision therefore to restore a tooth, we've got a lot of things to take into mind. We've got that crown to root, uh, crown to root ratio. We've got that position in the arch in terms of the strategic value, aesthetically and prosthetically. We have to look at the existing periodontal support, knowing that once we do crown lengthening, we're gonna lose some of that periodontal support because now we're removing some of the bone that is actually helping keep this tooth intact. We have to, again, look at the frication relative to that biologic width. Now that we have a better idea of how much sound tooth structure we need and how much we'll need to be removing, once we do that, will we or will we not be exposing a frication? Uh, endodontic considerations that you saw on that slide and also the root anatomy and morphology, uh, not only for post-placement, but in doing some of these cases, as you can imagine, even like a uh, maxillary first premolar with the, you know, mesial concavity, and how is that going to be going through there? So we've also got other factors. What's the predictability of the procedure? What are going to be the phonetic considerations post-op, which we'll talk about later in our complication area? Uh, once we do uh, the procedure and restore it, how effective will the patient be in terms of plaque management? And of course, looking at the overall cost risk and benefit ratio, like we keep coming back to, is the procedure worth it given we have all of these factors that we have to take into consideration. 
So again, highlighting on this cost risk benefit ratio, we have to think about things like cost, time involved from start to finish in terms of when the procedure is done, the healing time, and the final prosthetic part, which we'll go into in detail, how many visits are involved, again, the long-term prognosis, and once again, how predictable the procedure is. So again, as you can hopefully appreciate already, there's quite a bit of considerations. It's not simply looking at a tooth that doesn't have a lot of tooth structure and thinking, all right, no problem. Let me just lay a flap and remove some bone and you know, problem solved. There's quite a bit that we have to take into mind. So of course, what are some of the alternative uh, treatments that exist if we wanna look at some other options? Uh, you know, orthodontic extrusion, although again, maybe a little bit tedious and, and time sensitive, is another option in some cases. Uh, uh, and of course, the most obvious one we can have as an alternative would be looking at doing some type of extraction and some type of combination of either implants or some type of bridge work. So those are some of the considerations that we have to think about. So enough of the rationalization. So now we've got quite a bit of information in terms of what we have to consider in terms of the biologic width, in terms of some of our pre-op, intra-op and post-op considerations. So going in, we now know that there's a lot of these questions that we need to have answered, but now let's change our focus and imagine we've thought of all these things, we've answered all these questions and we've determined, yes, we have a case that is a good candidate for crown lengthening. Now, how do we do it? Let's talk about it. And in order to go over some of this, of course, we do have to discuss some of the basic instrumentation that is required. Uh, and to go through that, we will uh, highlight one of our sponsors tonight, Paradise Dental Technologies. Now, some of the instrumentation that is gonna be critical for this, of course, the one everybody can think of is the periodontal probe. And of course, as we all know, periodontal probes can come in various different sizes. I'm showing the UNC-15 here. <clears throat> but as you can see, uh, there are different types. There's, you know, 15 millimeter, 12 millimeter. There are ones that are marked, you know, incrementally per millimeter and some in groups of three. But the bottom line is in order to make our preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative measurements, of course, we all need our periodontal probe to help make sure our measurements stay intact. Then we have to look at some of our other surgical instrumentation. And some of them that we need to consider, well, one is going to be our surgical blades. Now, the most traditional one that we all uh, tend to have heard of or have used in the past is the number 15. That's kind of the you know, traditional surgical blade that's used. However, there are some other alternatives. One is known as the 15C, which as you can see on the photo is a much uh, you know, smaller, kind of a more surgical blade. Um, <clears throat> a lot of periodontists I know uh, like to use this because they feel it gives them a little bit more of a precise, uh, you know, cut when they're using it. Um, however, you know, I'm just as comfortable using a 15, so I don't see any issues with that either way. But again, for the sake of exposure, we go through that. And of course, there's that number 12 blade, which has that angulation, which depending on where in the mouth you are working, it can come really in handy, especially when, when you're in those far distal areas. Uh, those distal, those second molars, it can really come into play. Uh, retromolar pad or, you know, some of those areas can definitely uh, play some role for us. Now, uh, our friends from PDT uh, have taken this a step further because not only uh, do they provide a, you know, very great uh, scalpel holder, but they actually have holders that will put a 15 or any blade on there. And although I can't show you on this picture, the end of that blade holder will actually tilt and, and angle itself down. So you essentially could have a 15 blade that almost looks and acts like a number 12 blade because of its ability to curve. So again, depending on where you're working in the mouth, uh, this is something that can really, you know, come into, uh, you know, great, uh, great dividends for you. Uh, two of the other instruments that for me are indispensable. One is known as the boozer. As you can see, it has a, a small uh, spoon ending on one end, and it's got more of a flat end on the other. And you know, most of my initial flap exposures, I am actually starting with this boozer instrument for the simple fact that it is it is smaller, it is gentle. So in areas that are very friable, a lot of uh, you know uh, mucosa, lack of attached tissue, uh, and just in general, it's a more of a conservative way to be able to start doing your flap reflection. But once I've already kind of established some of it, I will tend to switch to what's known as a Pritchard elevator. And you can see a couple of different ones pictured here. On the left side, you can see the one that is straight. Uh, and on the right side, you can see another one provided by PDT, which 
has an end that is angulated. And where that can come into play is once your flap is reflected and now uh, your Pritchard uh, you know, instrument is up against the bone in order to keep the flap reflected, having that extra bend and that extra angulation can go a long way to kind of helping you uh, both from a visibility standpoint and from a flap, uh, flap stability standpoint. So those two instruments are definitely instrumental. Well, yeah, excuse the pun, instrumental. Uh, you know, the other parts that are indispensable, of course, are our curettes. And, you know, the main ones that I highlight that I like to use are the following. You've got your one, two Gracie, simply because it's a little bit longer, will give you a little bit of a longer reach and better access, depending where you are in the mouth. Of course, the seven, eight, known as the universal, of course, is known that way because it's universal. You could use it anywhere, comes into handy, especially more towards the anterior. And then we've got our specialty uh, posterior curettes are 1112, which is uh, for the mesial surfaces, or 1314 for our, our distal surfaces. So uh, these are all uh, instruments that come into play and are critical, and we'll show a little bit more why uh, in some of our surgical photos. Uh, another instrument that I also think is really important that I use quite often is known as a Pritchard surgical curette. Uh, as you can see, it has a very kind of thick uh, end to it. And so a lot of times, uh, again, as we'll try and show a little bit in the photos, uh, after initial flap reflection, just kind of removing some of the, uh, you know, bigger amounts of granulation tissue or tissue around the tooth before I start switching to some of those curettes. Uh, this oftentimes is uh, a very big help for me to, to get some of the bigger uh, bits of tissue out of the way. So that's one I like to highlight. Then we have a whole other uh, kind of category of instrumentation that are still very important that we talked about, and those are our chisels and our files. And we'll show later in some of the surgical cases where these come into effect. Uh, one that you can see provided by PDT is known as an ocean bean chisel, and we'll show later where this comes into play. But these chisels, despite the fact that they look really big, are actually very fine tipped and are very, uh, and are used to really get rid of very kind of fine corners of of bone um, that has been kind of left behind through uh, you know, some, some of the crown lengthening procedure itself. So we'll, we'll be able to highlight that a little bit better. Then on the right side, you can see what's known as a back action instrument, which again, we'll show again where it comes into play, but also a very important instrument for me in my armamentarium. And last but not least, I do like to highlight the bone file. Uh, this tends to be kind of my final instrument that I like to use. If you want to think of the easiest way to think of a bone file, think of a nail file. It's literally the same thing that you're doing when you're trying to smoothen out edges on your nails. It's the same thing you're doing interproximally for the bone. Once you kind of get through everything and you want to make sure everything is nice and smooth, you can use these bone files. So these are some of the instruments that I think everybody needs to have as part of their arbumentarium. Uh, the last two I want to mention are, are the Orban knife and the Kirkland knife. And both of these come into play uh, I would argue more for when you're doing your flap reflection. Uh, I put these more at the end because these are a little bit more um, case selective in terms of where you use them. This will come into play more uh, in distal areas of second molars. If you're having to uh, incorporate a distal wedge as part of your surgical flap design, which again, we will mention, uh, but both of these are very important. The Orban knife uh, can also be used alternatively as a first step to help you uh, release some of your flap and make sure your flap is off of your periosteum. Uh, if you wanna use that to try and loosen up the area before you start using your boozer uh, instrument. So it has multiple different uses and you know, you're seeing both of these, uh, again, that PDT offers and wanted to highlight those for you. Then of course, we've got the more generic ones we all can think about, tissue forceps, if we wanna have something uh, to hold, whether it be for suturing or helping for some of our flat reflection. Scissors, of course, don't need to explain why we need those. And of course, uh, at the end, when it's all said and done, uh, whether we use a needle holder or, of course, the most kind of you know, comfortable and, and, and best suited for a lot of periodontal procedures, the Castro Viejo, uh, it is really a game changer in terms of you know, our, just our dexterity in there, our, our access, and our, our ability to really kind of you know, target where we want that needle coming through. So that's a critical instrument. So again, all of these are really important. So if we change gears now, we, we have an idea of instrumentation, but now we got to think of some of the actual rotary, rotary instruments we need 
to do the procedure itself. And some of these you can see we're about to highlight in the next slide. Uh, the first is kind of the one I can't do anything without. And of course, that has to do with our round burrs. Now, there are different types of round burrs that are out there. As everybody knows, there are diamond round burrs and there are carbide round burrs. Now, uh, which one is better is really in the eye of the beholder and in the hands of the user. So uh, <clears throat> everybody has their own comfort level. Again, the carbide for me is a little bit more aggressive. You're at a much higher risk of, of, of ditching. Uh, when you're going in approximately. So myself personally, I prefer using the diamond uh, round burr. Uh, it tends to be a little bit uh, you know, more gentle and I think I can do a little bit more of fine removal with it. That being said, you know, I've had to do, you know, imagine you don't have a, a diamond round and you, and you ran out or you know, something happened and you had to use a carbide, no problem at all. Uh, so both work. The only thing I would very much stress to everybody is make sure you have surgical link burrs. It makes all the difference in the world. To try and do a periodontal surgery with regular link burrs, good luck. Uh, if it's in the posterior, you might as well just not even start it. It's very difficult to access and do. So whatever you do, make sure you are using surgical link burrs. So next slide, indispensable. We've talked about the round burrs and again, it being surgical link. Now we have to talk about end cutting burrs. And these are uh, a great tool for us. Now, what makes an end cutting burr so unique and so special for us is as its name entails, the only per portion of the burr that actually does any cutting, of course, is the end. So as you can see in that photo that's blown up on the right hand side, it is only the tip of that instrument, uh, instrument uh, of that burr at the end that has an actual cutting surface. So what that basically means is that as we use this burr and we're going in an interproximal area, especially when it's in a very tight space, which we're gonna come across on a regular basis, whether it's because it's in the anterior or whether because there's tooth rotation, whatever it might be, the last thing you wanna do is to have to go in with a round burr and to start doing damage to the adjacent teeth. By using these end cutting burrs, you can get into tight interproximal spaces, you can remove bone without doing damage to your adjacent teeth. So these are critical. Uh, the other part of the end cutting burr, which I think are great, is that having crown lengthening in mind, knowing some of the numbers that we discussed, they happen to have a marking specifically at four millimeters. So why that's so important is that as you are using your end cutting burr to do your lengthening, you can, as you do it instantaneously, have an idea of how much uh, bone removal you've done and where your margin is, because you can simply look at that mark that's there and know when you've reached that mark, you are at four millimeters. So that can save you a little bit of time and hassle between having to put your handpiece down and grab your periodontal probe and go back and forth and check. Of course, if you don't trust it or you're not sure, or you want to be sure else, uh, you know, otherwise, you can see on the right, we're just using our periodontal probe to confirm that yes, indeed, we're right at four millimeters where that mark is. So it's another great tool, another great thing to use. So in terms of burrs, those are the two primary ones we're looking at. We're looking at end cutting burrs and we are looking at those round burrs. Those are the two primary ones we're gonna highlight. Next thing we wanna do is talk about some of the surgical procedure itself in terms of the incision design. So in terms of incisions, there are basically two different types of incisions we're gonna learn and that you'll need to understand. One is known as sulcular incisions. The other one is known as the submarginal incision. And what the factors are determining when we do one versus doing the other are the following. Number one is again, where is that final restorative margin going to end? Or where are we anticipating it ending if we don't know for certain already? What is the amount of uh, keratinized tissue we are beginning with, which we'll showcase. And this is probably the biggest uh, factor that comes in. Uh, the periodontal biotype of which there are only two that exist, thin scallop versus thick flat. Which biotype do we have? One tends to favor uh, you know, use versus the other. We'll discuss that. And again, where the actual site of the incision is, are we looking at the buccal surface or are we looking at the palatal or lingual surface? So to go through them real quick, what exactly is a sulcular incision? Well, what a sulcular incision is by definition is an incision that maintains the entire marginal gingival tissue. It is made from the base of the sulcus parallel to the root surface, and most importantly, reaching the alveolar bone crest. So if everybody will look at the picture on the right, 
what you can hopefully see, and again, I don't have a laser pointer to point this out to you, you can see the blade that is coming through the sulcus. And as you can see where it is ending, it is hitting that osseous crest. So anytime you are doing a sulcular incision, it is critical that that blade is going all the way down to the bone crest. And as you can see then on the picture on the left, you can see why it's called sulcular is because you are literally following the actual uh, form of the gingival sulcus itself. Again, angled until you're getting it down to bone, and then you are going around uh, that actual tooth and those you know, teeth adjacent to it in order to do this incision. Now, the submarginal incision is an entirely different type of incision, and it's a lot more involved. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about the difference with this. Now, the submarginal incision is an inverse beveled incision, which is actually starting apical to that gingival margin, but is still going all the way down to osseous. So your starting point is different. Again, the sulcular incision, you are starting at the sulcus down to bone. Your submarginal incision is, at, is actually starting apical to that margin, but is still going down to bone. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is when is this type of an incision indicated? And if we are looking at the buccal surface or anywhere in the mouth, we're planning on doing a crown lengthening procedure. This type of an incision is only indicated in a buccal area where you have a minimum of three to four millimeters of attached tissue. Now, of course, why are we mentioning the buccal and why are we not mentioning the palatal side? Of course, because the entire palate is attached tissue. So what we'll find is that when we're working in the maxillary and we are doing uh, our incisions on the palatal side, we will always be incorporating the submarginal incision. Uh, however, when we're dealing with the buccal surface or if we're looking at the lingual surface uh, on the mandibular, we have to make sure that we really have a solid base of attached tissue. If we do not have this solid uh, you know, base of attached tissue, we do not do this incision. We simply do a sulcular incision. So let's talk about the technique and how we actually go about doing the submarginal incision. There's a couple different steps to it. So step one, first thing we have to do is we have to make our initial incision that is parallel to the long axis to the tooth. So again, we are starting apical. As you remember, we're not in the sulcus, we're starting apical. And how we know how apical we're gonna go? Well, it is all depending on the extent of the flap which again, the factors involved with it is how much cratinized tissue we have and how much crown lengthening we're thinking about doing. So again, if you look on the right-hand side and we try and use these cartoons to, to help guide us, you can see in point A, we've got an incision that is a couple millimeters apical to that margin. And we're following that same type of sulcular flow to it around the margin of the tooth, just more apically. And here you can see from that cartoon hopping through from one side to the other. So what you can see when that happens is that you can see that on this, now this new photo there with the dotted lines, unlike the sulcular incision, which those dotted lines would be coming in all the way to the margin of the tooth, this is further out because we've gone further apical. Once we've done this initial incision, what we are then able to do is to take our boozer instrument and just look at this picture first before we read the content. We'll be able to take our boozer instrument and with the outline of that submarginal incision, we can actually start our flap elevation. So you can see on that cartoon, once we've started our flap elevation, you have a collar of tissue in the sulcular area, which has remained, of course, because we have not touched that. We have now begun to elevate our flap. And then once we have done that, as you can see then on the far right picture, we have an area where our submarginal incision has been made that we can now reflect off of the bone. And we have left that sulcular gingival collar of tissue. Now that we have done that and that flap has been reflected, once we have done that, we can now come back and do what would be called a second intracravicular incision to separate that tissue collar that we have from the rest of the tube. So to put this in very simple terms, we've done a submarginal incision, we've reflect, we reflected our flap. What we are left with now is a collar of tissue, which we can now go back with, with a sulcular incision to go around the margin of that tissue collar that is left. 
So there is that blade going around that top area, essentially doing another socular type of incision for that collar. <clears throat> and now you can see on that cartoon, as you remember, the dotted lines were further out before, showing our first incision for a submarginal. Now you can see that second set of dotted lines doing our socular intracravicular type of incision. So that's step two. But well, we got one more step to go, though. And that is to do a third incision. And what that third incision is doing, it's made perpendicular to the root surface and as close as possible to that bone crest. And what that incision is doing, it is now separating that collar of tissue from the actual attachment. So if you again, look at the far right at the dotted line, you can see that dotted line is now perpendicular to where that sulcular incision was. So you can imagine we've come from the top down, we've done our sulcular incision and we've loosened that collar. But now what we've done is we've come perpendicular and we've now basically cut off that area of attachment that is still left. And you can see here, our fancy 15 blade coming perpendicular. And by doing that, we have now loosened up this tissue collar that is left. There again, you can see the dotted line. Another word you may have heard uh, for this type of incision, they say, if you are scoring uh, you know, the, the flap there, that's another way of saying this perpendicular type of incision. And once that is done, uh, we can use any of the instrumentation, our curettes, our, our chisels, our, our back action files, some of the stuff we had in our instrumentation section, and we can literally begin to easily remove this collar of tissue. So that is what is involved with that submarginal incision. Now, what's always critical with any type of a crown lengthening is that, you know, we have to have an understanding of how far we actually extend the flap. And it's very critical that that flap is extended at least one tooth mesial and distal from the involved tooth. There's a couple of different reasons for that. Number one is the, the tension that is applied on the flap. If we do not extend that flap far enough, uh, you won't be able to get proper reflection uh, of the area that you're working. It will create a lot of tension on the flap and will create a lot of tissue uh, tears, not to mention it's going to impede your ability to see the surgical area that you are looking at. After we do that, again, we can raise our flap. Uh, you know, we can do our full thickness flap and all the way down to the mucogenital junction, which we can then switch to a partial thickness, which again, not being a, <clears throat> not getting into too much detail on that part, more appreciating those actual three steps of the flap uh, separation itself. So again, there's our boozer, there's our Pritchard. Now that all that has been removed and our flap has been raised, we can now go in and do it. And I will show you here in wax, basically another appreciation of how this works. You can see that submarginal incision that has been made. After that submarginal incision has been made, our flap is then able to be raised. In this category, you're seeing it with a distal wedge incorporated. If you happen to have a pocket uh, or needing to do lengthening on the distal surface of a posterior tooth, you can see now that our primary flap has been raised. You can see that tissue collar that has been left that we still have to remove. And of course, this is being done pictorially. We're not able to show with a blade all three incisions, but you can imagine once we've done our sulcular and scored it by doing our perpendicular, we can now come with our instruments to remove that extra collar of tissue including our distal wedge if we happen to be doing one. <clears throat> and now we are left in this situation where that collar of tissue around the sulcus is removed and we've got a nice reflected flap. So this is just showing you, you know, one of many examples of this here with a, you know, a, a missing tooth right there in between. You can see those submarginal incisions that have been made. Once that extra collar around those teeth have been removed, you can see the, the good visibility that we have and the access that we have uh, in order to be able to do our next step of doing the osseous resection. So one thing to note, and, and as this picture will help demonstrate, a lot of times the questions we get are, well, if you remove the submarginal tissue, then how is your flap actually gonna adapt? How are you not gonna have this massive gap left over if you remove this one big portion and left this tissue behind? And basically, hopefully this picture will help you appreciate it. Uh, you can see here on the top, that portion A is that extracellular area that's been removed. 
you can see that area B that's been left over. And basically what you are doing in both of these cases by doing these submarginal incisions is that you are actually not only removing, but you are actually thinning uh, the flap itself. So between thinning the flap and then going and actually doing your osseous resection, what you will find, and we'll show uh, those in some of the clinical cases, is that that tissue will still adapt uh, very well, and you will not be left with some, you know, gaping space as might be what we would think initially from uh, some of those pictures. So now we've uh, raised our flap, and now we have to consider doing the osseous resection. So what are our options for that, and how does that work? Well, of course, it can't be that simple. There's got to be different types. And the different types of osseous resection that we are doing, one is known as ostectomy and one is known as osteoplasty. So the basic difference between them is that when we talk about ostectomy, it is actually removal of the supporting bone around teeth in order to eliminate the pockets. Whereas when we talk about osteoplasty, we're talking about the removal of non-supporting bones, stuff like tori, buccal ledges, which again, we'll, we'll discuss and will make a lot more sense to everybody when we show clinically. But the bottom line take home is when we talk about plasty, we're talking about removing non-supporting bone around that specific tooth. When we talk about ostectomy, we're talking about direct, direct bone that is supporting uh, that tooth. Now, in order to do uh, a proper and successful crown lengthening procedure, the reality is you are doing a variation of combination of both of these. You're rarely to never going to have a case where you're only doing one and not doing the other. They are both involved, so it's important to know uh, the differences and what they each are. So uh, <clears throat> just showing here on this model, one thing that I think uh, has made kind of the osseous resection easy for a lot of practitioners to relate to is that it reminds them of doing some crown preps where, you know, we were taught back in dental school of starting your first uh, step being kind of making a little uh, a, a ditch, a little depth cut there, uh, as you can see here in this picture. So that tends to help, especially as you're kind of getting the feel of things in terms of some of your osseous resection. Of course, you don't have to do any type of depth cut, but it can definitely uh, kind of help get that ball rolling. But basically, you know, when we were talking about doing uh, the removal of non-supporting bone and doing osteoplasty, there are going to be cases just like this that you're going to see that come into play. <clears throat> with any periodontal surgery, we have to deal with all sorts of bony uh, defects and bony issues like exostoses. We have what's known as buttressing bone or what is called buccal lipping, uh, especially with people that have that thick periodontal biotype. Uh, they also tend to have, the reason they have such thick tissue is because they've got a very thick band of bone underneath it, which then uh, poses a big, uh, you know, challenge for us when we're doing our osteoplasty because our flap adaptation and our, and our crown lengthening uh, will, you know, heavily rely on properly removing and, and recontouring uh, this buccal lipping that is there. And in many other cases, you will have what are known as infrabony defects which are combination defects uh, where you've got different types of gaps between the bones, sometimes different walls, one, two wall defects. Uh, and bottom line is you have situations where you've got uh, some pocketing involved potentially as well, where you've got very thick bone in some areas, very deep bone in other areas. So you're trying to balance a sufficient amount of bone removal to provide you the tooth structure you need for a crown lengthening. Yet at the same time, you're also having to manage some of these bony defects so that you're not leaving the patient with an inadvertent periodontal pocket or that you're not uh, removing so much bone that you're now creating some type of a critical situation for the tooth. So uh, there's a lot of these situations that come up. Sometimes uh, the, the amount of plasty that you do alone, especially in these cases with this thick uh, buccal lipping, just by doing the osteoplasty and, you know, recontouring some of that thick bone, you'll be amazed to find, you know, how much of the, the tooth looks like it's lengthened already, because sometimes this lack of tooth structure is influenced significantly by this thick bone uh, and the tissue overlying it. So just by, you know, doing some of this osseous resection around that bone, by the time you finish that, you will already note the way the tissue sits around that tooth that you had a significant amount more of lengthening than what you even imagined than what you had started with, a lot more tooth structure. So to keep in mind in terms of physiologic form, 
And the, the drawing here is a little bit, uh, I think, out of whack here. But what you'll find is essentially just keep in mind uh, that the scalloping of bone and tissue in the anterior is significantly greater than what you find in the posterior. The posterior tends to be more of a, you know, a lighter wave, less turbulent, whereas in the anterior, we get a lot more scalloping. And of course, that has to play a role when we are doing our actual recontouring and our osseous resection, because we want to make sure not only that we try and maintain positive architecture following that flow, but we want to make sure that we don't provide a physiologic form which doesn't match up. We don't want a molar with the physiologic flow characteristics that you see in the anterior, because that obviously is going to mean that we're probably removing too much bone. So going back to some of our definitions that we had touched on initially, now we've got an idea of instrumentation, flap design, and, and actual the steps involved with the osseous resection itself. Now we got to go back to putting these numbers together surgically in the numbers. If we look at some of the classic periodontal literature, this one from Rosenberg, what we find again is that for the surgical procedure, if we have less than four to five millimeter uh, of crown uh, exposed after our flap reflection, which of course is going to be the case for us in crown lengthening, we have to incorporate osseous surgery. Why I mention that is every now and then there are still questions about can you just do a, a little bit of a gingivectomy uh, and have that be enough? I, I've also uh, been encountered with that situation endlessly where I'll be referred to case and it'll be, you know, hey, you know, I just can't see this margin on the distal very well. Uh, you know, if you can just do a little bit of a gingivectomy and provide me an extra millimeter, a millimeter and a half of gingivectomy, then I'll have enough to see to capture the margin and we're all good. Well, as you'll see, uh, you know, through the cases that we're doing, and as you can hopefully appreciate now with the biologic width, I can tell you if all I did was gingivectomy, uh, what's going to happen is that tissue is going to grow right back and you're going to have problems down the line. And we're going to touch on that in the next section. So we have to make sure that we do the osseous uh, resection. Again, we can then go back with our end cutting burr uh, for our initial osseous surgery. And then we can finish it with a small round burr or in our chisels to refine the bone margin. So uh, <clears throat> this is kind of the classic guide from Rosenberg where they say you can start with your end cutting burr in the interproximal area, start to do your lengthening, then switch to your round bird to do some of the more fine work. That being said, uh, I can tell you, you can do this in multiple different variations. You can only use a round burr and nothing else. You can use an end cutting burr and nothing else, even though that's a little bit more work. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but it can be done. Um, one thing though, that I would recommend is however, whatever burr you start with, uh, that when you start, whether you're in the interproximal, which is usually where you tend to begin, uh, or on the outer areas, that you are, are very uh, conservative when you start. So in other words, if you've got two millimeters of tooth structure and you're planning on exposing, let's say, another two or three millimeters, whatever that number might be, uh, I would never start the procedure by, uh, in the interproximal area, removing that full amount right off the bat. And the reason for that is you will create a very significant dish and what you'll oftentimes find, a lot of people do that starting towards the buckle side, interproximately and, 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 and on the buckle, they'll remove a lot of that tooth structure right off the bat. And next thing you know, when you go to that palatal side, you're left with a very disproportionate amount of, of bone removal. Uh, <clears throat> and again, depending on some of those factor, uh, factors like rotation involvement, uh, and, you know, what's going on with the adjacent teeth, being over aggressive off the bat uh, is not good. I would do it more incrementally. So let's say we were planning on removing a total of, you know, let's say three millimeters. I would maybe remove two millimeters right off the bat in that interproximal area, then start to go to that buckle and to that lingual or palatal side and begin to blend things in. So rather than it being a very hard three steps of, you know, remove all the bone here, then all the bone there and all the bone there. Uh, for me, it's a little bit more kind of like an artwork. It's more of a flow. You begin in one area, then you glide your way to another area, over to the other area, and you kind of incrementally uh, take stuff down and take stuff away. Um, so that's some, some things to keep in mind for that. So again, going back to what I was mentioning before, you can appreciate from this picture here what we talked about when you've got that very thick buckle bone. In this photo that you're seeing here, 
basically 90% of what was done there was just osteoplasty. So again, it's not direct bone around the tooth. It's this non-supporting thick extra bones sticking out on the buckle. And just by doing your osteoplasty and blending in that bone and giving it that physiologic form, that positive architecture, you can see just by doing it alone, it, it, it looks like you've done all this crown lengthening around the actual tooth. It looks like you've done all this ostectomy when this result has just been coming from doing the plasty itself without anything else. So again, you can appreciate how both of these roles uh, and both of these steps are, are necessary uh, and can make a significant difference. The other part you can hopefully appreciate is why your flap reflection needs to be at least one tooth beyond the tooth you're working on, uh, both from a visibility standpoint. And of course, if you're in these areas that have the stick bone, uh, it's, it's a lot better to be able to address uh, these problems uh, altogether. There are a lot of cases too, where you'll find uh, big defects and gaps between the tooth, which maybe at this time, the patient doesn't have a periodontal pocket, but those gaps are significant, uh, you know, catch areas for bacteria uh, to get stuck and to create periodontal pockets over time. So by, by being able to, you know, uh, do your osseous and recontour and remove those gaps and defects there, you're doing the patient a big service in the long run. So again, more of the literature in terms of uh, crown lengthening, what needs to be removed to back up some of what we had mentioned early on. A classic period article by Wagenberg, again, talks about having a very aggressive amount of tooth structure, five to five and a half millimeters exposed during the crown lengthening procedure. Uh, and Bragger, again, looks at wherever your margin is, having at least three millimeters of bone uh, beyond that. Um, and talking about doing an apically positioned uh, flap, which we'll talk about uh, for areas that are displaced for one to four millimeters. So we'll talk about that more uh, with the suturing section. So again, just to kind of show a side-by-side, -side, uh, you know, a quick generic before and after, again, appreciating what we started with, what we've ended with, how much more tooth structure is there through that combination of osteoplasty and ostectomy. This was that case we showed uh, with that flap reflection early on when we were showcasing that uh, submarginal incision. So the other aspect of it, which of course uh, it needs to be touched upon is having the proper magnification and illumination. Uh, I know times have obviously changed quite a bit now. I think the vast majority of us uh, in on this lecture now are hopefully using loops, but I can tell you uh, if, if you are not and you are planning on uh, incorporating crown lengthening procedures more uh, into your practice, then I, I cannot emphasize the significance of having proper magnification and illumination, uh, the difference that you're gonna see and your ability to you know, clinically actually do the procedure uh, you know, as well as possible are gonna be night and day. Uh, of course, our, one of our sponsors and who I work with uh, side by side is Oroscoptic. Uh, the reason why I, I particularly use them is simply because of their technology. I think what's really important uh, with anything in the perio world is we always look at literature in terms of backing things up. And you know, this uh, group has always had plenty in, uh, of literature that has been able to showcase uh, their products and why what they do actually works very well. Um, the other aspect that I think is very critical uh, is the actual quality of the vision that you see. And what you'll find is there uh, is a term known as CRI in terms of the quality of, of, of what you can actually visualize and any value that's considered 60 uh, is considered to be very good. And a lot of the you know, other companies uh, that I've had loops with in the past and that are out there, their numbers are around 60, but this new generation of oroscopic loot, I, I'm actually highlighting um, the, the type that I have, which is why I have it on the screen. Uh, they have a CRI that is over 90. So again, the actual quality of what I'm seeing is, is significantly enhanced, which again, doing what I do and hopefully for each of you doing these types of procedures uh, cannot be you know, emphasized further. And of course, the other aspect of it is illumination. If I was to try and rely simply on my overhead light, I could have five overhead lights in my room. It still doesn't do the job. I'm still not able to see small tissue tags, small areas of bone, which you'll appreciate in some of these surgical cases, which we'll review without proper illumination. 
And what I can tell you is I, I use this Endeavor uh, XL light, which is very important because uh, the light itself has a uniform round spot. And again, why I mentioned this and why I, I wanted to showcase this to you guys is the focus and all of the energy of where my illumination is, it's targeted to where I'm working. It's not being dissipated. I'm not getting 80% of the light in one area and 20% of it kind of lost being spread out. I have that light focus where I'm going to be uh, working. So in terms of its ease and comfort, it makes a huge difference. So again, uh, for all of us doing these cases, I, I'm assuming most of us do it by now, but if not, this would be a great consideration for all of you without the magnification and without the illumination, I'm, I'm literally blind. I can't do it any other way. So uh, important to mention that because you can't do these procedures without it. So now we hopefully have understood uh, our <clears throat> flap design, our instrumentation that we're gonna be using, uh, we have an idea now of, of how we're going about the osseous resection between plasty and ostectomy. We have an idea now of how much bone we need to remove and, of course, how we need to have good illumination. So now let's assume we've gotten through that procedure and it's time to close up. What are we going to do in terms of suturing? So we're going to talk a little bit about some suturing basics. I'm going to put glass here. So... A lot of different sutures out there, uh, and we're just going to kind of highlight the main points um, and the main ones that are probably the most common that you're aware of. So the first one we're going to talk about is what is known as chromic gut. So one of the reasons why the chromic gut suture is so popular and so used is simply because of the fact that it is, excuse me, that should have been up later. Uh, the reason for it is that it is a resorbable suture. So that can come into play for us for a lot of different reasons. One of those reasons simply is, in, in some of our cases, our patients may not be able to return post-op for suture removal, which we'll discuss when uh, later on. But imagine you have a patient, you do a crown lengthening procedure on, and they're going to be traveling. They're not going to be coming back. Or let's say they are traveling, not maybe not abroad, but they're, they're coming to see you for the procedure from far away. Sometimes here in Boston, we have patients that are coming from, from Maine or, or in the summer, they're coming from the Cape and the traffic is brutal. And the last thing on earth they want to do is to be driving back again in that traffic. Uh, so, you know, there's different types of considerations, but the bottom line is that the chromic gut suture is a suture that will actually resorb and will go away. And what you'll find is that there is another popular suture known as the polyglycolic acid suture, which is what you've been uh, heard of in terms of a vicral suture. Now, this one's very interesting because a lot of people think of a vicral suture as being non-resorbable simply because it takes so long for it to go away, which we'll talk about below. As you can see with a chromic gut suture, a chromic gut suture will tend to resorb itself sometime between seven to 10 days. On the flip, the vicral suture will take upwards of a month in order to resorb. However, it is still a resorbable suture. So for accuracy terms, a vicral suture is not non-resorbable. It's just that it takes it a lot longer to actually resorb. And for the purposes of crown lengthening and any, and any type of periodontal surgery, we do not want to be leaving sutures in the patient's mouth for one month. So uh, in, in the case of being uh, able to see the patient for suture removal, which we'll talk about later, uh, we can feel confident in using a vicral suture because we know we'll see them and we'll be able to remove it. But if we are not, the chromic gut is the best way to go. Um, <clears throat> the regular plain gut is not a good option simply because it resorbs too quick and is not something that's going to stick around long enough. And you can see again, duration times for some of these sutures. Now, oh, apologies, I wanted to go over one last thing, which is on the right side, which you can see is silk. Silk is an example of a non-resorbable suture. So unlike Vicro, which takes a long time, or chromic gut, silk itself does not resorb at all. And a silk suture, you've all probably seen at some point, it has that characteristic black uh, color to it. We'll see it in some of our slides. Now there's a toss up in terms of using a silk suture. So one of the pros of using a silk suture is that it, it is extremely easy to use. And what I mean by that is that it passes through the tissue very comfortably. Uh, it is very easy to tie. 
It has a very good amount of uh, kind of tensile strength to it. It will stay in place. It is sturdy. It will do a really good job for you uh, in terms of the actual flap ad adaptation and holding its form very well. So of course, then why don't we just all use silk? And while the primary reason for that is, of course, there's a pro and con to everything, the con to a silk suture is that it wicks bacteria faster and greater than any other suture material. So if it's in an area that especially is on a patient who is already uh, very poor with their home care and oral hygiene, using a silk suture is probably not a great idea because now you are inviting a whole host of bacteria and you know, all sorts of inflammatory issues at your surgical site, which is of course not something that you want to do. Now, the flip side to that is something like a chromic gut, which again, the beauty of it is that it resorbs away. So makes life a lot easier. It makes life easier for the patient. But I can tell you one of the cons of a chromic gut suture for those who you know, haven't had to use it much is that it, unlike silk, which is very easy to pass through and very easy to use, chromic gut can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. The reason for that is as you pass that needle through and use it more and more often, uh, as it wicks more blood, it becomes a lot more stickier. Uh, it's a lot more difficult to pass through the tissue and becomes a little bit of a pain in terms of your management to the point where what I often end up doing is through each pass, once I make a tie, before I go to my next site to start my next suture, I am actually using a wet gauze to run it, not once, but multiple times through. If you then look into your gauze, you will see you've got a nice streak of blood that's on there. And I do that in order to make passing through you know, my next suture a lot more comfortable and easier to do because if it does catch a lot of blood, it becomes a big pain. So you've got a lot of kind of pros and cons to each, but I just wanted to kind of throw some of those out there. And again, throw this chart out there for, you know, a kind of a comprehensive look. <clears throat> The other thing we have to look at are, you know, what the heck are all these numbers and letters and all this fancy talk on there and what is it even referring to? Well, the first one we're going to talk about is that number you always find in the corner. You all have heard of 3040506 on what is it exactly uh, relating to and what that is relating to is the actual thickness of the suture itself. Now, unlike what you might be thinking, the bigger the number, the thinner the suture itself is. So it's not, not the opposite, not thicker, the thinner it is. So a 5-0 suture is thinner than a 4-0, uh, which is again, thinner than a 3-0 and, and on and on you go. Uh, for these types of uh, procedures, I would never in any type of procedure, but you know, crown length thing, which we're talking about now, I would never go any thicker than a 4-0. 4-0 would be the thickest I would go. Uh, feel comfortable to go with a 5-0, or if you want, you could even go with something thinner at a 6-0 if you want, uh, no problem. But 4-0 would be the thickest I would go. To me, anything lower than that, if you're in 3-0 or less territory, you might as well be at a rodeo. It looks like you're going to, you know, lasso, uh, you know, a, a bull or something like that. So I would stick to 4-0 as the absolute baseline thickest. Uh, the other number that you'll find, uh, and just to make life more confusing, depending on which company you use, you happen to get a different kind of coding that they're talking about. But basically, uh, with this system, Ethicon, the number there refers to the actual needle itself. So there are basically two different types of needles that we uh, will discuss and will basically be using. And <clears throat> one is a PS or what is called an FS2 needle. Uh, which is what you can see up there on that Vicro, which is our, our bigger uh, 3.8 cutting needle. It's our bigger one that we can pass through molar areas uh, much easier. Our other needle that you'll find is what is known as a P3. You can see the cross section of it there. And that P3 is a much smaller needle. It's got a, obviously it's a much smaller size, a smaller curvature. This comes into play uh, in aesthetic areas, in tight interproximal areas, and in cases where we have very, very fine uh, tissue. If you have, if you're doing lengthening in an area with no attached tissue and a lot of mucosa, you put an FS2 or PS2 needle in there and you know do your passes and try and tie things off. You might be at risk of getting a lot more 
tears of the needle going through that P3 is a lot more kind of gentle uh, and smaller. So I like to simplify my life. Uh, I keep things between those two big needles. Of course, translating that to the assistant sometimes can get confusing when I tell them grab the FS2 or grab the P3. So now I've even simplified it further with some of the assistants in some practices where they know, am I getting the big needle or am I getting the smaller needle? And again, that is that difference between that FS2 uh, and that P3 needle. That is what it is referring to. Now, one good thing, and uh, you know, again, it's, this isn't, I'm not sponsored by Ethicon, but just to throw something out about them that I've always liked is that Ethicon's uh, sutures, uh, especially that, that chromic gut that they have come hydrated for you. So this is also a big pain in the butt because some companies, their sutures actually are not hydrated. And if you are to take out a chromic gut suture uh, from the wrapping, it is all coiled up and, and going back and forth like crazy. And the last thing on earth you can do is to start suturing with that because it is again, all coiled up. You will literally go crazy. You have to go back to that trick I mentioned of getting a wet gauze and passing that wet gauze over and over. And then you will see that suture actually begin to straighten out and kind of unwind itself. However, if you go with uh, Ethicon, one, one great thing about them is that they come prehydrated. So as soon as you take that uh, you know, needle uh, out of its case, it's already hydrated. And so it's already nice and straight and ready to go. So just an extra plug about them. That's just a personal preference on my end. So now we have to talk about the actual suture design. Uh, and basically for crown lengthening, the two basic ones that we need to incorporate are the simple interrupted and the vertical mattress. So let's just focus on the top only right now. Uh, again, unfortunately, we're not in person for me to do a hands-on with you guys like we normally would, but uh, I'll do my best to explain this to you guys uh, via computer. Uh, the simple interrupted, I'm sure most people are familiar with. Uh, we'll start on that left side there, imagining that that's that buckle area. We're simply passing uh, our needle from that buckle side through, and we are taking it straight through that lingual side and out the other end, and we're bringing it back to tie it off. So that is our simple interrupted. Again, it's pretty simple. Then we have another type of uh, suture technique known as the vertical mattress. Now, the vertical mattress comes into play when we talk about crown lengthening, because what this, uh, what this suture does is that it actually will adapt that tissue and actually help hike it down further. So now if you're thinking about uh, what we've done in terms of our procedure, we've done our flap or submarginal incisions, we've removed that bone. So now what we're really able to do with this incision is we're able to approximate the ends very well with one another rather than what happens a lot of times with a simple interrupted where they tend to kind of come together and hike up this type of an, uh, suture instead will really approximate that tissue very well. And it will also approximate that tissue in an apical fashion, which again, for the sake of that tooth exposure is something that we are uh, looking to do. So how this uh, suture design actually works, I'll run through this very slowly so everybody can appreciate this process. Uh, everybody start on the left-hand side. And what we are basically doing is again, we are starting on the buckle, but what we are doing is we are starting more apically at that buckle area. And we are grabbing uh, that tissue apically, essentially down to where that mucogenable junction or end of that uh, margin is in our lengthening. We are going down to that apical area. We are passing that needle from the buckle and we are just coming out the other side, except what we are doing now is unlike the simple interrupted, where we go from the buccal side to the lingual side, we are actually in the vertical mattress. We are starting on the buccal. We are coming through that buccal tissue, but then we are actually going back out from the lingual side of the buccal flap back out to the buccal side. So I know again, that sounds confusing, but if you follow that picture, you imagine, and I'm trying to point it out on the camera as best as I can, you come in from your buccal, that will then come out here, that lingual side. And then what we are literally doing is we are passing that needle back up and through 
and back out on that buckle side. So everything that is being done on the first part of the vertical mattress is both starting and ending on the buckle. We're just coming through apically and we're coming out coronally. And where you want your coronal exit point to be is somewhere near the tip of that papilla. Now you want that because when you finish doing this suture, which we'll do in a moment, you want that tissue approximation like we talked about. So you want that exit point to be uh, at that gingival papilla area. However, that being said, you also have to be careful to not go too close to the tip. Because if you do that through the process of going through and then tying this off, you then would be at risk of tearing through that papilla. So you want to be in the papilla, uh, but again, not right at the tip, just a little bit uh, further down to it. So taking a step back here, our first pass, everything is on the buckle side. We've come through from buckle into the lingual part of that buckle, and we have now uh, reversed our needle and we've come back out that buckle side. Once we have done that, we're now going to the opposite side and we are doing the exact same thing. So it's like looking at a mirror image of what we did on the buckle side. We're doing the exact same thing now on our lingual or our palatal side. So we're coming through now from that palatal side. We're coming through the palatal side on the, you know, the, the, the palatal aspect of it through and then back out and around through the, the, the tip of that papilla. And then we're bringing that back over to the buckal side and tying that off. Uh, again, I wish this was in person. It's a lot easier to show uh, on an overhead together, but uh, I hope uh, that kind of made sense to everybody and I'll be happy to go over it again later if we need. But by doing that, what you will find is that when you tie things off, you're able to approximate that tissue uh, and then apically position that tissue as well. So those are the two main types that we want to talk about. So I just have another water here. So we've uh, showed this case now several times and uh, I only show this to have that before and after. Again, we've done our uh, our osseous there. And basically, I just want to show here in this picture, and again, we have plenty of these, so uh, we'll get through them, but you can see this combination of the vertical mattress and the interrupted. So this case has an edentulous site, uh, but basically, um, you know, the take home, I would say, whether there's an edentulous site or not, we tend to do that um, vertical mattress when we are in that interproximal area. If we have an edentulous space, you know, we can do that simple interrupted there if there's no tooth. But, you know, in general, we tend to prefer doing that vertical mattress, especially in that interproximal site because of that type of flap adaptation. So here's just another uh, example there of a tooth that lacks tooth structure. Uh, here we go with these two, looking at it from both sides. And again, after our submarginal incision has been done and that flap has been removed, we now have good access. We're able to raise that flap. And again, I'm just showing you in this case what that vertical mattress looks like. So what you can hopefully uh, appreciate there is that that initial bite that you can see is very apical. You can see how apical that bite is. And it is giving us that type of flap adaptation that we want. And again, we'll show more in some of the cases. So before we go into the actual clinical cases, we have to uh, touch on a very, very important aspect. And that is what should we expect for our final result? And what is it that I mean by a final result? Well, there's always this question of now that we've done our crown lengthening, when can we actually begin to restore it? And what's going to happen with the tissue now that we've lengthened it? And I think the results might surprise you a little bit. So Ponteriero came out with this article, and this was in, as you can see, 2001. And when this came out within the periodontal community, uh, there was quite a bit of an uproar uh, and there was quite a bit of shock. And the reason for that is the following. Now, what Ponteriero was looking at he was looking at how much the gingival margin regrows, how much that tissue returns over time. And he looked at those numbers up to a year. And what did he find? He found that after doing a crown lengthening procedure, upwards of one year after doing the procedure, 
there was still coronal migration of the tissue. So let's think about that for a moment, right? We've done our crown lengthening, we've removed bone, we've done these uh, vertical mattress, apical position flap, osseous resection, we've done all this work, we've got a great result, surgically, clinically, it looks great, I've got more tooth structure, I'm happy with life. But now here comes Ponteriero saying, well, now wait a second, because upwards of a year after you've done the case, you're still gonna be getting gingival regrowth. So you shouldn't be rushing to restore these cases because you know, your margin is going to change over time and one year later. So that kind of scared everybody. And so they started looking at this in a lot more detail. Uh, and a couple of years later, Diaz came out with this article looking at osteosurgery over six months. And basically, there were a couple of conclusions that he came up with, which are very practical for what we're talking about. First of all, he confirmed what Ponteriero said. Uh, that there is some tissue rebound. However, he separated from him in the sense that he said how much rebound actually occurs is actually directly related to the position of the gingival margin relative to the crest at the time of suturing. So basically his argument was the following. His argument was, look, don't stress so much about where exactly your flap is uh, place when all is said and done, your vertical mattress, uh, your simple interrupted. Don't stress so much about the flap itself because your success and the amount of regrowth uh, you're going to get of that tissue, of rebound, I should say, that you're going to get of that tissue over the long run is really just dependent on how much bone removal that you did. And if you did enough bone removal, you're not going to have as much rebound. And basically his numbers show the following, as you can see, in uh, <clears throat> cases that they looked at tissue rebound six months after surgery, in cases that had uh, less than four millimeters, especially obviously two or one millimeter of, of osseous removal only, you can see the amount of rebound that they had, upwards of a millimeter of tissue rebound. Whereas in cases where four or more millimeters of bone were removed, you can see that that gingival margin remained stable. In other words, you did not get rebound. So this kind of matches with some of the other periodontal literature and some of the other stuff we established earlier, where we really have to make sure that we have removed and provided ourselves at least that four plus millimeters of healthy sound tooth structure in our crown lengthening. Because again, as this study further re reiterates, if we do less than that, if we haven't done enough, we are going to see tissue rebound. Now, Ponteriero says that's gonna happen upwards of a year. Diaz says that's gonna be happening up to about six months. So what does Lanning say? Well, he looked at things from a different aspect and he looked at things both at three months and at six months. Now he was focused more specifically looking at the biologic width. And this is something that will be really pounding on heavily uh, in the part two, because this comes into play and basically goes uh, about how we go about treating the aesthetic cases. But essentially what he was trying to argue is that each tooth has some type of predetermined biologic width. In other words, each tooth has its own biologic width, complex and proportion. And as long as we are uh, following that type of uh, complex, then our, our end result is gonna be stable. But basically what he found was similar as to what Diaz said, is that the biologic width was fully reestablished to the original pre-op dimension by six months later. So it took six months for everything, for the dust to really settle, tissue rebound, biologic width reestablishment to a healthy, secure, stable level, that took six months. And of course, what he also found was that more than 90% of the sites that had three millimeters or more of bone resection had a stable gingival margin. So this goes back to everything that we have uh, been talking about. And the take home message is if you remove a sufficient amount of bone, we can expect over time to have a stable gingival margin. If you, we do not remove a sufficient amount of bone, we can expect to have tissue rebound. We can expect to have this tissue rebound happening upwards of six months. Uh, and this is going to create a huge headache for us. Imagine we've taken our final impressions uh, and everything is, of course, being made. 
uh, based off of where the margin is that day, but you know, maybe over time, a few more weeks, months later, that margin, depending on what we did for our osseous and bone removal, might still be shifting and affect uh, you know, the quality and the end result that we are having. So take home, make sure we remove enough bone. And part of what they argue is, you know, make your suture designs nice, but at the end of the day, you know, whether you've done an interrupted or whether you've done a vertical mattress or however nice it may look, your end result isn't going to be determined by how great your, you know, your suture or what type of uh, suture design you, do, you went with. Really the biggest factor that's going to make all the difference is how much bone you remove. So again, looking at that classic Rosenberg paper, uh, it's looking at the same type of thing. What we're worried about post-treatment is gingival rebound. What they found was that you found uh, that they found the least amount of rebound on the distal lingual surfaces and the greatest amount on the facial aspect. Uh, and what they basically wanted to argue, we talked about time and what we should be looking at. They found that the, the goal time in terms of when to complete your definitive restoration, they argue is between three to four months. And in some cases, upwards of six months after crown lengthening. Now, of course, I know probably half of everybody, well, probably everybody's jaw is dropping considering this. Why the heck am I going to wait three to four, forget about six months? But again, the literature is clearly showing us that we are getting some type of rebound that is occurring. So this is when it is suggesting for us to do it. So our take home messages from this are the following. First of all, if we didn't know what was happening before, we sure do know now. Tissue thickness does matter. We do expect rebound. And this should even further harp on the point on the cases and the considerations that some of you may have had in your mind at some point of, well, if I can just get a little bit of a gingivectomy and, and I can see that margin better, as you can see, not a good idea. The moment you do that, as things heal, you're going to get tissue rebound coming right back up, and that's going to create biologic width uh, issues over the long run. So expect there to be rebound. What that rebound might be is going to be critical in terms of knowing where your final margin is going to be before you've started. So you can have an idea of what amount of lengthening that you're going to need and what that is going to do uh, for the tooth and the longevity of it. And as we said, you know, a lot of times too, just give me a little bit on the distal, just do a little bit of gingivectomy. I don't want you to remove too much bone. Just give me a little bit of lengthening is what I hear often, oftentimes, far too often. But as I hope you can appreciate through the literature and what we're showing, we want to be conservative for the sake of the patient, but by being too conservative, by thinking, oh, if I just don't remove, you know, that much bone, it might be a good thing as we're starting to learn that can actually create headaches for us in the long run. So we have to consider uh, lengthening more or the proper amount to be safe. Now, what does that mean? That means that that very popular theory uh, that we've all kind of had since we were in dental school in terms of, oh, we'll do a definitive restoration of six weeks and we're good to go. Well, according to the periodontal literature, that's just simply not matching up. It seems like that's just too soon. And that tissue just has not had a sufficient amount of time to heal itself. Uh, and basically the, the, the gold standard that the different type of articles are trying to suggest is that three months uh, is really kind of our, uh, minimal ideal time we'd want. The bottom line, whoever you want to look at and whoever you want to quote, is that the more time we can provide, uh, the better our chances of having a stable margin before we do that definitive, um, you know, prosthesis. So, you know, I, I'm certainly not, you know, here to tell everybody from now on, start waiting six months before you do your definitive uh, restorations. I know, of course, we have to take some clinical realities into account. And if we all start telling our patients, hey, look, you know, we're, we're in May right now, uh, you know, we're going to get this done. You'll have your final crown in November. They're probably going to get out of their chair and run for their life, a lot of them. But it's a matter of how you're presenting this information, of course, why, um, and really, you know, looking at the case consideration and understanding you really need to provide uh, more time in order to let this uh, tissue to actually not only heal, but to, 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 to become stable and not continuously shift. So as I've gone over from the beginning and I will continue to harp on, we have to keep considering 
is this procedure still worth it? Not in terms of do we like doing it or does it have positive effects, but knowing all of these types of factors, how much bone we have to remove uh, and all the work that is involved, is this still the best thing for us to do? So with that being said, we'll look at a couple of cases. I, I can't get through all the ones we have simply because we won't have time, uh, but I'll get through a couple just to show some examples and then we'll hop through part three. So here's one case in the molar area. Just to show everybody, you might've seen this slide earlier in our presentation. Uh, you can see in this case, uh, we just did not have a sufficient amount of tooth structure there. <clears throat> and as you can see clinically, you can see when uh, we have our provisional restoration off, we just have a very minimal amount of tooth structure. One thing very characteristic to biologic with issues that we'll see in some of the other slides as well is that red and raw bleeding tissue in the interproximal, which is always a pretty good sign for us of something going on. But even without that, it doesn't matter. Our naked eye can show us that we just don't have a lot of tooth structure there. So we can do our preclinical measurements and again, uh, confirm the fact that we just don't have much there. And in this case, as you can see, both on the buccal and the palatal side, what do we have an ample amount of? We have a very thick amount of keratinized tissue, which therefore on our buccal side is giving us that opportunity to incorporate that submarginal incision that we talked about. So you can see that submarginal incision being made. In this case, it being on the distal area and us uh, having a little bit of a pocket in that case on that distal area, we incorporated a distal wedge, which I know we're not going into a ton of detail in this lecture, but just for the sake of you understanding what, uh, what I'm showing here. Uh, so you can see that submarginal incision after it's done, uh, that, uh, that secondary amount of tissue has been removed. Now it already looks like, wow, we've got a lot more tooth structure, but that's simply because of uh, the tissue itself that has been removed. And here you can see that tissue collar uh, that's there. Sometimes you can get it all in one piece, which you know makes for a great photo, but bottom line, you just need to make sure you have it all removed. Uh, now comes the, the, the arduous part of using some of those curettes and instrumentation uh, that we talked about of removing that granulation tissue and giving us a clear line of vision, which we'll show, I think, better in some of these uh, following cases. But bottom line here, you can see with that flap reflected, having uh, more tooth structure there. <clears throat> and we provided a lot more uh, tooth structure there on that tooth number 14. And here with our sutures, you can appreciate those vertical mattress sutures uh, coming from one side to the other, which is helping uh, apically position our flap. Uh, you can see we've now provided a very healthy amount of additional tooth structure which when we replace our provisional that was there to start with, uh, I think everybody would find uh, that that would hopefully be more than enough uh, to structure there, but probably you know a good thing for us, given what we know now about tissue rebound and how much sound tooth structure we really need. And you can see at the suture removal, which we tend to do ideally around two weeks time. Uh, again, if you are going with a chromic gut suture, it will self-dissolve on its own, usually sometime between a week to 10 days. Uh, if you are going with a non-resorbable or a vicral <clears throat> suture, you typically wanna see that patient uh, at two weeks to do the suture removal. Um, the longer it stays there, if it stays too long and it starts to become loose, it loses some of that tension on there. It's really not doing, doing you any good. And the longer those stay on there, it becomes a plaque trap. So you also don't want to be uh, having too much bacteria stuck on there. So now you've got your provisional on there. And by three months, uh, once that's been popped on, of course, this was done right, uh, right when they popped it on. So cleaning the area had a little bit of bleeding, but bottom line, you can see they were able to provide uh, a, a, a very significant amount of tooth structure and get a nice uh, crown on there. So we want to talk about this case, very uh, important, called the Widow's Peak. And this will incorporate some of our instrumentation and talk about why the instruments and burrs and everything are so important. So you can look at this premolar uh, that's here. Again, from the occlusal, you can uh, appreciate what we tend to see with biologic width invasion, where you've got that red raw bleeding area on the distal. Uh, here's the accompanying uh, radiograph of that case. So what I wanted to just uh, display here is some of the actual steps that are done uh, from what we talked about earlier. So 
we've raised our flap. Here's our situation. We can see uh, our lack of, of, of sufficient tooth structure there really on both sides, but obviously predominantly on the distal, but on both sides nonetheless. So one of the first things that we're doing, you can see some of that uh, tissue that is there around the tooth. What that will tend to do, you will always know if you haven't gotten all your granulation tissue clean because you'll still have bleeding around the site. It's kind of like an extraction socket. Uh, you have to make sure you curette, you curette all that uh, tissue out until you're just left with bone. This is always the most tedious part of any crown lengthening or osseous type procedure. It's a pain, but it is necessary. So we'll use some of that instrumentation uh, from our friends at PDT to remove some of this tissue. And now, assuming that everything is nice and clean and lovely, we can go back with our combination of diamond round burrs and end cutting burrs, and we can do our combination of osteoplasty and ostectomy. And as you can see, again, we're really going around everywhere. Here's the end cutting burr, just again, to show you a pictorial of it. And like I said, in an area where you have a tight interproximal space, whether it's this case or any other, having that cutting edge only at the interproximal can really uh, make life a lot easier. So what you can see here is that we've done uh, <clears throat> some of that on that distal side, and we've done a little bit of it on the mesio. We're not done yet. Uh, uh, you know, we've done a little bit more on the distal simply because that's where we needed the most uh, done. But there's something else that we want to focus on, and the point of this case is to show you the following. These two arrows that are pointing there are pointing to bone. And so this is why it's so critical, first of all, to have removed enough of your granulation tissue, because if you have not, and the area continues to bleed, it will block your visibility and you will not be able to see this. Number two, this is why it's so important to have proper magnification and illumination, because without those loops on, some of these little uh, bone areas that are left over will also be far more difficult to see, again, especially if there is bleeding. Now, what these little bony peaks are called, and here is just in comparison what we started with, and what's going on below there in terms of after our osseous resection, you can see those little two peaks that are sitting there. What ends up happening as a result of leaving these types of bony peaks behind is that you have now by accident and unknowingly most likely subjected the patient to having an inadvertent periodontal pocket. And the reason that that ends up happening is that when we close the tissue up, our periodontal, uh, our, our, our tissue, our gingival tissue is simply following the contours of the bone below it. So think about put, putting a blanket or in this case, the tissue back over this area. Well, if we have this uh, spiked area of bone, well, that's where that tissue is going to lay, except what's going to happen where that tissue lays like that is that we have now created something known as the, a widow's peak, which is that extra peak of bone. And so what ends up happening is that on both interproximal areas, that tissue is gonna sit on that high point, which is on that peak. And by doing so, you can now see that type of vertical gap that has been created. And we have now inadvertently created a periodontal pocket for our patient. So we may have done some good crown lengthening and have more tooth structure exposed, but once everything heals up, little will we know it until over time they're coming back for maintenance visits, but we've now taken a healthy periodontal uh, condition and created periodontal pocketing because again, the tissue will sit right against the bone. And if we leave a bony tip, that is where it will lay. So what we then need to do is that this is where our other instrumentation that we talked about earlier, our back action file, our ocean bean chisels, our bone files, whatever those might be, that, that is where these come into place. These ocean bean chisels are designed uh, you know, for the meso on the distal side. You will be able to come up against that widow's peak and be able to basically remove those areas, whether it's with that chisel uh, or that back action. And what you'll find now is once we have actually done that and smoothened that out, rather than having that vertical slanted peak that you saw in the previous photo, we have now been able to properly smoothen that out and remove that widow's peak. 
So we will no longer have a periodontal pocket. So you can see just that small amount of bone makes a very significant difference. And if we haven't done a good enough job with our granulation tissue removal, if we don't have good enough illumination to even identify it is there. And again, uh, talking about your neighbor's house versus your house, crown lengthening is a procedure that has to be done uh, that affects the neighboring teeth as well. If your focus is only on the tooth at hand and not on the adjacent tooth, whether it be mesial or distal, it is very easy to, re to, to leave these types of widow peaks uh, and, and high areas of bone behind and inadvertently create a periodontal pocket. So once that is done, we have uh, vertical mattress sutures. In this case, you can see with chromic gut. You can see once that provisional has been put on, the cement obviously needs to be cleaned uh, a little bit more and a little bit better. But bottom line is you can appreciate the additional amount of tooth structure that is now present. And over time, what you can see is that that uh, tissue uh, has that pink color. We've got our extra healthy tissue there. And in this case, it was two months uh, until the restorative uh, doctor took you know, pictures, sent these over and had those placed. Now, of course, from what we're learning, maybe it would have been better to wait a little bit more time, but this is what was done um, you know, in this case in terms of waiting for two months. And here's the same patient six months later. Uh, we can appreciate again, the color of the tissue being nice, pink and healthy. And we have a crown, I think, uh, you know, that will serve this patient for a long time. So it would have been a shame uh, to have gotten this type of a look, but go and probe around there and see that we have five or six millimeter pockets because we inadvertently created that pocket as a result of the widow's peak. So I'm gonna have to kind of go through some more of these cases so we can get to our last section which we had a lot more time, but here's to show uh, two teeth here that are back to back. Again, you can see the uh, incisions that uh, have been done, the flap removal. You can see after osseous resection, the extra amount of tooth structure that we have there. And again, using our uh, vertical mattress uh, in, uh, you know, sutures there, you can see how that flap has been adapted. And I did want to show one of these cases that is a traditional crown lengthening, but in the aesthetic zone uh, from a colleague of mine that sent this over. This was a great case simply because what you can see is that this was adjacent to an implant, which, uh, sorry, I'll go back a slide here, uh, adjacent to an implant. So there are cases when this is going to come up, it's even that much more challenging because the last thing on earth we want to do is to start removing a lot of bone right around an implant area. So we have to be a lot more careful and conservative and look at our measurements. So here's what that case had looked like. And you can see once the uh, provisional was placed back on, we had uh, over time a very stable periodontal margin, no bleeding, no redness and additional tooth structure. So I just wanted to show in this case real quickly that in the aesthetic zone, even if it's around implants, uh, it still can be done. You just have to be, obviously be uh, pretty careful. This is even a, a bigger challenge than that. This is a different case, but this is a very periodontally involved case. But the point I wanted to show on this is where you have a combination of pontics, where you have not an implant, but a big empty space. Uh, there's two take homes from this. Number one is just by removing the actual provisional itself. You can see the tissue itself. It is red. It is angry. Uh, it is not very happy. Uh, and again, this is something touched upon more in part two uh, of, the, of the crown lengthening stuff. But the bottom line is by doing just a little bit of reprepping uh, of these teeth and changing the actual lo the location of the margin, we can significantly alter uh, the periodontal health here. So you can see even before uh, the surgery was done, just by modifying those preps and giving the area some time to heal, we had a much more, uh, you know, healthier periodontal, um, <clears throat> you know, attachment apparatus before we even went in uh, into that case. So again, insufficient tooth structure, uh, submarginal incisions, uh, that are done in this area. And we have our flap removal. We can see uh, the tooth structure that we have with our periodontal probe. And we have our vertical mattress suture. In this case, those purple vicral sutures that are there. Uh, and again, you can see this increased amount of tooth structure that's been provided, which can then be restored. So as we'll talk about in the next section, there's a lot of stuff we can talk about with a case like this in terms of aesthetics, phonetics, all types of stuff, which we'll brush upon. But in terms of a strict crown lengthening, um, this was a case uh, done uh, through, I believe, one of the residents that I did want to showcase.
Uh, to talk real quick about laterals, these ones are killer because uh, as you'll see, they have significant aesthetic outcomes. So you can see this was a case that was uh, determined that they by all means had to keep the tooth. The patient did not want to have it removed, wanted to have crown lengthening. So the long story short I want to show is a couple of things. Number one, look at the radiograph. You can see what happens when you're in a tight space and you don't use an end cutting burr. You can see some of the ditching that has been done uh, on some of the roofs. Uh, number two, you can see the amount of recession that is caused now both on the central and the canine as a result of doing crown lengthening. Like I said, every endodontist can do a root canal, every periodontist can do a crown lengthening, but is it necessarily the best thing to do? There is an argument and a debate for that, which is specifically why I show a case like this. Uh, I will show another one right here, which is in a similar boat. Again, to demonstrate for a lateral, you've got that angry look to it again. And again, the long story short, why I show this is by the time the crown lengthening is done, yes, you've got a lot more tooth structure, but again, at what expense, both aesthetically, phonetically, uh, you know, the longevity of the tooth, laterals don't tend to have the longest roots to begin with. So again, I, I just show these for more examples, not to say, hey, this is a great crown lengthening case, but more to show uh, examples of are these cases where now knowing what you know, would you still continue to do these types of cases? Would you crown lengthen this case or would you not? And the last one, which I love to show because this, this is a great one to show again, uh, it, it doesn't even look like there's a tooth there, but sure enough, there is a canine, which again was stressed on doing a crown lengthening because we have to save the tooth. So sure enough, crown lengthening was done. You did get a more amount of tooth structure, although I don't see what on God's name you're going to do with this. And surprise, surprise, as we might have expected a few months later, that one failed and it turned into an extraction and in this case, the immediate placement of an implant. So again, I show these uh, cases to give you uh, kind of a full breadth of things from both the traditional aspect, but also from the standpoint of begging the question that we've come back to from the, from the very beginning of, you know, it's a great procedure, but are all these cases, is every one of these cases in need? Is it worth doing this uh, type of procedure? So uh, I can't go through more cases because we have to finish up these last sections and then get to your questions. So I did want to touch briefly on post-op and maintenance. Very important. There's no point of doing the procedure if the patient doesn't follow your instructions after and doesn't maintain things. Pretty much a waste of time. So general rules in terms of post-op instructions, what I do, we tend to prescribe them ibuprofen, uh, typically up to the 800 uh, dose, Obviously, based off of their medical history, that can alter if the patient has stomach problems, is on thinners, or whatever reason cannot take ibuprofen. Obviously, we're comfortable going with Tynanol. Uh, we do uh, uh, prescribe them Paradex rinse, which we instruct them to use uh, ideally at least twice a day if they decide they want to use it further. Fine, fine by us, keeps everything that much cleaner, but at least twice a day. Keep in mind, as everybody may know, Paradex can cause some staining for some people. So for those that do, a trick that I tell everybody is get your Q-tip, dip your Q-tip into the Paradex and rub the Q-tip around uh, the surgical area, the sutures, et cetera. So you don't therefore have to rinse everywhere and risk uh, you know, getting all those teeth stained. Of course, it comes off during the cleaning, but obviously freaks a lot of patients out. More advanced things like uh, narcotic medication. Honestly, I do not prescribe Vicodin or anything stronger than that. First of all, periodontal procedures heal via inflammation. The primary thing that's going to help us are anti-inflammatories. The, the extra juice they're getting from Vicodin really isn't going to help for the healing. Uh, and the extra, you know, nausea and pain that, you know, comes with doing it is really not worth it. Um, however, can you prescribe it? Sure you can. Um, for cases that are either more traumatic or if you know your patient tends to react uh, very strongly to any type of uh, perio procedure, they tend to get a lot of swelling, bruising, that type of thing, you can opt to add a steroid uh, onto your medication list. Uh, Medrol dose pack is probably the best and easiest. It comes in a pack, lasts a couple of days, and there's a significant amount to help with overall swelling um, and just kind of that first few days of, of discomfort. Dexamethasone is an alternative, another type of steroid pill, which we usually prescribe uh, at the 0.75 milligram 
milligram dosage. It's done after the first day. They take three right away. They take three before they go to bed, two the next morning, and it's done. But that's another medication that, uh, uh, that also helps. Antibiotics, for those who are curious, are not a standard of care. They are not necessary for this procedure. So please uh, keep that in mind. You do not need to give antibiotics for a crown lengthening procedure. Basic post-op instructions that we give them. We ask them to not brush or floss that area for a minimum of 10 to 14 days. The last thing we want is to have done the work, have sutures, a flap that is healing, tissue that is forming new connections and going in there and, and you know, scuffing it up. Uh, we tell them to avoid hard or sharp food, uh, you know, ribs, tortilla, chips, uh, popcorn, hard bread, you know, stick to room temperature stuff. We do tell them to expect initial cold sensitivity because we are now, we have now exposed more tooth structure. They may not have it, but if they do, much better to tell them that it might be coming up up front so they're not surprised and thinking something is therefore wrong. Uh, we do talk about the chance of potential swelling or bruising, um, potential depending on where you're working and how short along the route might be uh, of some possible initial mobility right after doing the procedure. Uh, we tell them to avoid heavy cardio for the first two days so that they don't put extra pressure on the, reason, uh, on the area and cause any pain. Like I said, our suture removal tends to be at two weeks. And what I've tended to see uh, through most practices uh, and what we usually end up doing, again, not our definitive restoration, but in terms of now having more tooth structure and if they're having problems either with their provisional staying on or cold sensitivity and wanting to you know, kind of begin the process of, of providing more coverage of that, uh, you know, extra tooth structure that's been uh, provided. Uh, a lot of times we'll see that the new provisional be made a small supercrestal uh, reprep be done uh, around three weeks time. The other part I want to mention from a maintenance standpoint, which is really important, uh, is actually what they're doing for their take home in terms of brushing and flossing uh, and actually what they're using. Now, uh, I, I honestly would say <clears throat> not very long ago, this was something I didn't really harp on very much, not because I you know, wasn't a fan, but because I really didn't think there was a significant difference in terms of what we're actually biologically and mechanically using for ourselves. But I've come to experience firsthand a significant change just in my own, uh, you know, changes in, in home care. And I want to share that. And I've gone through this with a, a very large group of, you know, patients that I've treated ever since and seen the same difference, which is why I want to share that with everybody here. So there's two aspects to the long-term maintenance. One is mechanical and one is biologic. And what we want to look at from our friends uh, at Crest uh, and Oral, Oral B at, at P&G are the two different aspects from the mechanical mechanical standpoint, uh, a pretty, you know, revolutionary new type of uh, mechanical brush known as the Oral-B IO. Um, and from the biologic standpoint, the Crest Pro Health uh, uh, toothpaste. And again, you know, I, I say this simply because I didn't use any of these in the past. I used different things and really didn't think what I used uh, was going to make a big difference. I really didn't think there was a big difference between them, but uh, I have been uh, pretty much humbled uh, pretty significantly by this, which is why I'm so open to, to talking and sharing about this. Um, in terms of the IO itself, uh, it's a whole different type of, you know, brush that's out there now, which basically the long story short, I, you know, instead of all the fancy terminology, the most important things for you to keep in mind is the way it's been designed. It's very efficient. So I used to use a, a diamond cutter Panasonic before. And what I saw was that the, a lot of the vibration and the energies were just kind of being dissipated. It wasn't really being honed in on the area that I was using to brush. And thanks to this new design they have with this linear magnetic drive, what you'll find is that all the energy and all the resources of the actual brush are going into the area that you're doing. So it is very efficient and very effective. The other thing that I love uh, about it isn't so much that it's interactive, but I love this pressure sensor that it has. So I am one of those, like maybe a lot of you that tended to brush too hard when I was younger and I can never really sense, well, how do I know if I'm brushing too hard or not? Well, now you've got something that provides you with literally, uh, you know, on the spot feedback. So, you know, as you're brushing, you'll see different colors, 
which uh, you know correspond to how much pressure you're putting. And as long as you're in that green zone, which has been found to be optimal for the plaque removal without causing damage uh, and trauma to your tissue, it will be green. So I was amazed to see different areas in my mouth where in fact, I was doing it too, uh, too hard, which is why I have a little bit of recession, frankly, and need to do some tissue grafting of my own. So this has been great. Uh, the brush head design, again, not to go into the science of it, but why I say it's significant is because my diamond cutter before and other toothbrushes I use, not long after using it, it starts to fray, it starts to bend, it's therefore not effective. This tuft and tuft trim design that they have, I've had mine for months, it is solid as a rock and not solid as in it hurts, but solid as in it doesn't deform, it keeps its shape, which then allows it to do its job better. And the longer basically, you know, length of it allows it to access the area far better. And last but not least, which <clears throat> is what made me change things is me having used that sonic biocare the literature that has been proven and is out there is pretty significant in terms of what it does in terms of bleeding sites gingival bleeding reduction overall gingivitis reduction no i i did not have you know severe gingivitis or anything like that however again the reason why i'm so comfortable talking about this is that using this uh, after a very short period of time, I noticed a very significant change in terms of what I was feeling and the difference. So uh, the key from it, from a biologic standpoint, is stannous fluoride, which is the key ingredient in the actual toothpaste, which is the only thing that carries all of these different properties, which uh, most other toothpaste only have some of these uh, chemicals in there, but with stannous fluoride, you have something that is able to provide coverage in all of these different areas. And basically the stannous fluoride is able to inhibit the plaque growth uh, and suppress the, 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 you know, the pathogens that are there. So the proof is in the pudding. It's really changed what I'm using now and the difference I've seen in my own mouth, which is why I've now uh, impressed this upon my patients. I've seen a significant difference in their overall home care and their periodontal status. Uh, so for me to do all the surgeries and to see that things aren't healing as well because of their home care and to see things heal that much better as a result of simply using a different brush and a toothpaste makes all the difference in the world. And it's a simple thing. Uh, so I encourage uh, this as a, as a strong recommendation, not just for how far it goes subgingively, but again, all the things it does uh, to the toxins. So last thing I know, we're right at 9.30. I literally have probably two, three minutes left and we're done and we'll get to your, pre uh, your questions. The complications, having gone through all of this that we touched on earlier, what is it that we're worried about? We don't want to cause a frication. We don't want to create phonetic in impairment, but a lot of times, whether we like it or not, crown lengthening in the aesthetic zone will create black triangles, will create a phonetic impairment and hypersensitivity. So more reason we got to keep asking ourselves if it's worth it. What we talked about earlier, that term CDF, that critical distance to the frication, what the periodontal literature showed was that uh, in studies over 10, uh, over about 40% of the uh, teeth that they treated were found to have frication involvement after doing a crown lengthening procedure. So what they found is that if you measure the distance to the frication uh, to be four millimeters, if you do anything more than that, you're going to be at a significant risk of creating and causing frication involvement as a result of doing crown lengthening. So that CDF, that critical distance to the frication is four millimeters. So if you go, uh, if you have something less than that, you're in deep trouble. If you've got a short root trunk and you do crown lengthening, now you may inadvertently cause frication, which thanks to this classic uh, perio uh, article back in the 70s is even more significant because the take home message of this showed that over 60% of the teeth that they studied in, in these areas, the frication areas are smaller than the smallest diameter curette tip that we even use. So the bottom line is if you create a frication, <clears throat> obviously it's not a good thing. The only thing worse than it is that once it's created, not only is it there, but a lot of our curettes are not even small enough to get in there to be able to clean things. So we may be causing inadvertent long-term damage simply because we did a crown lengthening procedure in an area that we thought might be caused. Again, as we talked about the inadvertent periodontal pocket, another potential complication. So our final conclusions to wrap things up, 
I hope everybody can appreciate that functional crown lengthening is not quite as simple as it may have appeared coming in. There's a lot of stuff we have to take into uh, effect. Yes, it can save teeth, but it comes at a cost, not only to that tooth, but our surrounding teeth. We have to ask ourselves, is it worth it or not? So I hope uh, that uh, helped everybody. I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. I thank you all here again from Boston. I know it's very late here on the East Coast. Uh, I will stay to help answer questions. Um, I do dedicate this lecture always to Dr. Salkin. He was our board member who gave us that quote uh, early on first year about crown lengthening and it being the most difficult thing. Uh, he passed away uh, soon after my residency, but anytime I talk on this subject, I always dedicate the lecture to him. Uh, and some take home information for everybody. Um, if anybody would like to reach out, uh, that is my personal email uh, that you can email me at. Um, I am not a big social media online person. However, I've just started to try and make a website, especially since doing a lot more of the speaking. So in terms of keeping up to date with upcoming uh, lectures and other speaking engagements and just more background, uh, a website that's still in the works, but uh, you know, up there and active right now. Uh, and more background for me from a background perspective, uh, I did publish this book during the quarantine, The Financial Survival Guide for Dentists, uh, hoping to help early career and graduating students uh, you know, get a financial foundation, since of course we never learned any of this in dental school. And our ear aid, <clears throat> Uh, product that I developed uh, to help against noise-induced hearing loss, another lecture that I'm very passionate about uh, and speak about on a regular basis. So uh, those of you who are familiar with having hearing loss and one of your ears not hearing well, it's no joke. It's because of what we do in our profession. So look into uh, this product and look into lectures that I'll be doing on that. So with that being said, thank you everybody so much.